Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. In our episode today, we have a very very special guest, um, Mrs. Minakshi Lekhi ji, Member of Parliament from New Delhi constituency. Minakshi ji, welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaste. Thank you very much. So, um, Minakshi ji, uh, our uh, um, our viewers have been very, very enthusiastic about your participation in this program. They've been sending in a lot of questions. So we are going to have a cracker of a session. And let us start with a introduction about you. Could you please uh, share with our listeners when your political life started? Where did the, bu the bug of entering politics bite you? And now you are the second time member of uh, parliament from uh, New Delhi constituency. A little bit about yourself, madam. Uh, so, um, I would say that I was uh, involved in social um, uh, work and things right from my college and school. Everybody has participated in uh, declamation contest saying, um, uh, what will I do if I become the prime minister of the country, India of my dreams? Everyone has done those topics. So, I was like any other school debater or college debater who has done all kinds of things to uh, reach my master, my, my uh, I mean, it's a bachelor's degree uh, before becoming a lawyer. And that's what I did. And uh, my exposure to politics started happening in that, uh, that age when you are 17 plus and, and going to college in your first year, second year, that was the time when uh, a lot of upheaval was going on because I joined my college in 1984 just out of my senior secondary 84 and i grew up in delhi so 84 was the rights time uh, when rights happened in delhi and that was my real exposure to real politics uh, beyond declamation and uh, i got involved with uh, nss work and there was a professor called uh, mr keda who was not directly my teacher but someone who was sociology teacher and you'll be surprised that I ended up uh, uh, reading. I've done BSc honors uh, before my law, but I ended up reading everything about history and sociology as as my extracurricular because of the things I got involved in in, in during college uh, times. And I read up everything about Bertrand Russell and God knows what all. And those were the years when you get influenced by all kinds of ideas and you're rebuilding your um, thought processes at that time. And then finally, I joined law post my graduation. So I, that was my exposure. And post my graduation, I started working as a lawyer and uh, long years of practice. And I used to, um, you know, uh, was always uh, attracted to um, anything but Congress. So used to uh, work on various social movements. Uh, I remember uh, when when Ram Mandir started, and I was, and how uh, Babri went down. I was uh, uh, two years in profession that time, and um, uh, then Trishul thing happened, and how I got uh, involved with uh, the VHP of those years. Uh, Swadeshi happened and was working with Swadeshi, uh, uh, but I never had the intention of, you know, uh, working myself up for the electoral politics. So the idea was always the intellectual politics and keep giving ideas to other people who were supposed to implement it. Finally, in 1990, uh, 19, uh, uh, 2010, I came to the conclusion that all the papers and all the things and all the amendment and all the laws that I have been foisting on others uh, and are not going forward, <laughs> it's time to do it yourself because uh, uh, it's, it's hard to implement your ideas through others. Uh, so uh, for implementation, you need an agency and who better than you yourself because you understand the con context and concept far deeper. So carry on the process. In 2010, circumstances were such that I was doing um, a couple of uh, backroom job for uh, some of the TV channels and I was advising them how to carry forward the debates, who should be the guests. And never got credit for those kind of work because those are all pro bono kind of things. Uh, but gave me a different kind of exposure. And here comes 2010 I, and I joined uh, 
uh, BJP as the uh, National Vice President of Mahila Mocha and uh, Smriti ji was our president. Uh, Nitin ji was uh, the uh, party president that time and that was my initiation into direct politics. And here I am, um, uh, uh, then kind of from Mahila Mocha I became the spokesperson, continued doing that, I got elected, got elected second time, got the taste of it and um, uh, just doing my bit to what I think politics should be all about. Well, madam, um, we are hearing some good things about uh, more progress for you. And if that happens, uh, all the best to you. And uh, today, now we shall jump into our topic of the day, uh, Citizenship Amendment Act. So viewers, um, last week, two more cities, San Francisco and Chicago, city councils passed the same anti-CAA Act. And if you look at the wording of the six cities that have so far passed this, almost identical wording. And uh, all these are democratic city councils. So there is a certain amount of similarities among these different uh, moves. And, and we are going to see more perhaps democratic elected city councils pass this thing. But here we are first to understand what led to the passage of this bill by one of the lawmakers who was involved in passing this bill. So Meenakshi ji, CAA, according to me, was the fulfillment of a historic promise made by the parliament to protect the minorities left on the other side on the partition border that they would be cared for and if required, welcome within India. So what explains this protracted and coordinated dissent against CAA within India and now with, uh, outside too? Um, I am really, really surprised and I tweeted about someone, if I may not name that person, uh, uh, because that person has tried to uh, cozy up to the idea of India. Uh, but I did say that uh, literate need to be educated. So simply because you are literate doesn't make you educated enough. And especially the people who are sitting in US need to pick up the book and read the law. And these people are some people who have not even read the law, who do not understand the implication of um, international law, who do not understand what persecution is, what religious persecution is, and fortunate enough that they call themselves Democrats. So Democrat by definition is a liberal person who understands the value of persecution better than conservative, who knows that people who have to be democratic or have to understand the democratic ethos will also understand and strictly in terms of law, Article 1 of the UN Convention of Refugees does recognize religious persecution. And I think Hindus by and large in these countries have been the persecuted class which has gone unrecognized for centuries. And even with UNH, uh, UNHCR has not gone so far to recognize. And I put certain questions while debating this subject that I have a question to UNHCR, I have a question to Amnesty, I have a question to uh, uh, US uh, Council on Religious Freedom, etc. that please give me the data how many Hindus from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, have you given asylum to? And the answer was zilch. They've never even raised up this issue. They have never raked up. They've never tried to even understand. Now, the fact is there is a class which is a persecuted class. And of all the people, people living in United States should go back and read their own law. And that law is Lautenberg Amendment. Now, Frank Lautenberg, being a senator for 28 years, brought this law to safeguard the interest of Jews coming from Russia and uh, uh, Catholic, uh, Christian, Orthodox, Christian, etc. were subsequently uh, taken on board. Then they uh, applied this law by subsequent uh, enlargement of the act to uh, people from Iran, included Baha'is and all these uh, sections and classes. Unfortunate that if there is any comparison with CAA, it can only be with Lautenberg law. 
and the uh, Lautenberg Amendment, rest of the countries recognize refugees on different classes and uh, different types. So there are different kinds of refugees. It could be social, war stricken, uh, but, rec uh, but recognized form of persecution is what was faced by Jews and what has been faced by Hindus, especially in these countries. And Lautenberg Amendment did not deny other people right to refuge. It only expedited the process of certain classes. And this is precisely what CAA has done. Uh, interestingly enough, CAA has given the right to uh, refuge to people who have entered country before 2014. So very clearly, we came to power in 2014. Before that, we had no control. And whoever has entered the country before that, so there are people who have been in the country for 30 years, 50 years, 70, uh, 16 years, so on and so forth. The normal requirement of law is that you enter the country and the process like within five years, seven years, you apply for permanent residency, then you apply for a citizenship within seven to 10 years, you're likely to get. So this has only expedited the process. In fact, the only ground for expedition is that these people have been in the country for more than double, triple the normal time. So 30 years, somebody has been living in this country without being a citizen. How do you regularize that? You need to regularize these people. And when you are regularizing these people, there is no other way of regularizing other than expediting the process. And that's what CAA has done. CAA, according to me, has done nothing off the mark. CAA has only regularized people who are persecuted class from other country. And that country, which was earlier part of India, the, the most interesting part is these are not outsiders. These are people who are civilizationally, historically, and religiously connected to us. Unfortunately, uh, the other new countries never kept their promise to protect their own minorities. It is for this reason, where will these people go? Now, if somebody is living in India and in terms of international law itself, so the international law will recognize certain processes and recognition of these processes is that you cannot send a refugee which has entered your country to a country of origin where he's a non a no citizen because his or her rights are not protected, you cannot send back send them back to those very places. Now I want to ask United Nations Commission for Refugees, which country are you planning to take them? We will give it to you. Give us. The fact <laughs> is, then they will say, "Oh, sorry, we cannot give you because you are not signatory." Now, if I am not signatory, how on earth everybody who is persecuted anywhere in Asia or in the world is ending up in at, at India's door. For centuries, we are we are giving refuge to people without being a signatory and obeying the international commitment to laws. And, and I'm very, very surprised that uh, uh, certain leaders uh, have been making those statements. And that's why I call them uh, uneducated. They may be literate, but they are uneducated on the nuances of law. They are they are not reading up right. They are not consulting others and making it into a Hindu Muslim issue. I will say take all Muslims. When you have given, when you have given rights to Jews from certain countries, why did you not give it to the Muslims? You should have given it to the Muslims. Why did you not give it? And the concept behind that is there are some 59 odd countries for Muslim who are which are Islamic Republic, where these people are more comfortable because. Whoa. Uh, in terms of uh, civilizational connectivity, uh, religious ethos, etc. They are more comfortable there. They have other places to go. But tell me which country in the world is accepting a Hindu religiously persecuted person? And where has UN or any other body intervened or entered? Yes, indeed. Um, one of the uh, things that the members of city council who are voting on these resolutions need to understand is that the CAA is only three pages long, just three pages. It will take you all of seven, eight minutes to read this. And if you see that, there is nothing there that favors one over the other. This is something that is a very straightforward piece of legislation. Yet, you know, their innocence is being exploited by some vested interests to keep the pot boiling again and again. So, um, so we actually, as the field comes on, we will have more specific questions. But I wanted to ask you a simple question. 
now that CAA is an act of parliament, CAA is an act of parliament. What do you see happening on the ground next? And would you like to put a time frame on it? So, uh, so what's happening on the ground is very clear. There are vested interests across the globe who are trying to uh, break up certain issues and misdirect people. And they are linking it to unlinked, unchallenged. And these are very, very recognized policies across the globe. Whether it's United States, whether it's UK, or it's USA, or it's Australia, or it's Europe, or any other developing, developed country, there are methods of migration. So there is, a, there is a method by which certain people can migrate. There are policies under which refugees can seek refuge. And uh, there are laws and protocols set up. Now, unfortunate part is that all these people wanted India to continue having no policy for migration. And the most unfortunate part is, though we have a citizenship law, but irrespective of the law, Anybody could migrate, get an Aadhaar card, become a voter, and get into the country, whether you are an economic migrant, or you are a, a citizenship seeker, or you are a refugee, there's no distinction. And you could just continue to doing those things. And uh, people from across, I, I always say this, I said, if we are such pathetic, bad people, why do you want to migrate to my country? Go find refuge elsewhere. But the fact is, all the migrations are happening in my country, and none of the migrations are happening in other countries. Everybody is wanting to come here, and nobody is going elsewhere. And the simple reason for that was that our doors were always open. We are a very liberal, democratic class, and we never persecuted anyone. On the contrary, we are the ones, people like us who are persecuted in other countries, are the ones who never had a place to go to. Now, who else is giving them refuge? So on the ground, what has happened is that there is a club of certain um, elements. I will not say who, but I'm sure everyone is bright enough. So somebody will arrange the funds. Somebody will arrange the uh, protests. And somebody will rake it up here, there. Now, there is, a, there is a manner in which all of them are connected. And this connection is very visible, which happened during CAA and which happened subsequently. My Both my speeches on CAA and uh, Delhi rights, if you see together, you will understand what I'm trying to imply and what I'm trying to say. So other than this, nothing else is going on. Everybody has accepted and everybody with the liberal thinking should accept that persecuted class is being given citizenship. Where is the problem? Where is the problem? Either you're trying to say this is not a persecuted class, then you have to give the fact and figure. And the fact and figure is at the time of independence, 1947, 1951, and so on and so forth. If you look at the census report, so Hindus in those countries were something like 32%, 28, 29%. Other one in Pakistan, it was close to 15%. Now, where have those 15% disappeared from 1951? And they have, why have they become 1.7 to 1.28%? Either they have been killed or they have been converted or they have left the country. That means the 1.28% who is existing in that country is a vulnerable class. And that's what Lautenberg Amendment also recognizes that religious persecution individually need not be proved. But if you can show the data and you recognize this is a, this is a vulnerable class by the history or by the methodology, political uh, or social methods, you know this is a vulnerable class. So individually, one will not have to prove that I am uh, being victimized. You have to say this class is victimized per se because they have no political representation. They have no place to go to. Their young girls are getting picked up. Underage girls are getting married. Forced conversions are happening. And uh, this vulnerable class has no, no place to protect their religious and social rights. So. Here, we are going to expedite their citizenship right. And I would go to that extent that CAA is not even doing that. CAA should ideally be doing that. What CAA is doing? CAA is doing that 2014, till 2014, whoever has entered this country, 
legally illegally again in terms of un convention that you cannot force a person who is a vulnerable class on the ground of reciprocity you cannot deny refuge to that person so in this case i cannot say because pakistan or uh, bangladesh is not recognizing my citizens to get uh, citizenship in their country i will not give them they are technically citizens of those two countries or afghanistan for that matter so in terms of exactly in terms of international law on refugees this law has been made possible second ground you cannot send those people back to the very place they have come from because they are a persecuted class you can't send them back two conditions met third condition you cannot use illegal illegality that illegality in their arrival as a criminal process against them because that illegality has happened due to the circumstances they are forced in because they are a persecuted class now if you compare this law say australian law now australian law is very strict on this that if you are illegal you have to go back to the international waters and you have to go back to the third country and until and unless you are legally called for as under the uh, refugee law and they give you a valid visa without valid visa you will not be recognized but no voice against that and i'm not saying you should have a voice because each country will have their own internal mechanism by which you can adjust accommodate so many people you will provide uh, help to so many people and based on that you will have your internal equation at the cost of your own national you will not grant uh, benefits to others that's as simple as that and under those circumstances i think caa is a fantastic law which is only registering and regularizing the people who have been in this country for such a long time where is the opposition coming from so minakshi ji uh, you actually segued me nicely for the next question that i was going to ask you uh, recently the parliament of united kingdom and australia has offered a route of citizenship of around 3 million hong kong residents um after the enactment of national security act by the communist chinese communist party this yeah. move has been welcomed by all democracies in the west this yeah. route to citizenship is offering the same outreach which caa is offering in india now this is a question for the city councils who have voted and i i would i'm hoping that you can also add to my uh, observations here are you guys thinking that there is a good caa and there is a bad caa how else can you explain your behavior perhaps you can shed some light on it uh, binakshi ji i would i would say again i am not competing with uk in fact i'm welcoming uh, 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 boris johnson's decision on this and the way he has uh, extended uh the the migration route and uh, he has enhanced the scope by increasing the time earlier time period used to be 6 months then it got enhanced to 1 year and he's made it 5 years and yet it does not give citizenship by the way it does not give citizenship it is short of giving citizenship now if this is a welcome move which it is i am also welcoming it how is ca not welcome because ca is giving you permanent residence and citizenship it is more it is beyond what uh, uh, what you get as a uh, bno i mean a british national uh, overseas under what and bno has its own defects because beyond 97 it does not recognize people so with all that you're welcoming which is a fantastic move because somebody has stood up against the communist party of uh, china and i definitely welcome it because coming it from uk welcoming uh, uh, 3 million odd people to join them it's it's a fantastic move but caa is a step further it is recognizing it is recognizing a persecuted class it is granting them permanent rights it is not waiting or enhancing their paths but absorbing them allowing them to function as uh, citizens where is the problem and it is my country i am 130 million people and yet i am welcoming some people legally and illegality if at all there was it is all in terms of the international law you know what happened if somebody is living in living in this country for 30 years obviously the valid visa on which that person came has expired 
beyond validation he never got it validated because he never wanted to go back government of india if at all had the opportunity they should have sent them back they have never sent them back because they could not send them back there is no other country in the world which offered the uh, path to these people that we will offer them citizenship let them come to our country united nations uh, human right commission never intervened amnesty never looked at them so where are you what are you going to do with these people and only regularizing them is what ca has done and that's what you are opposing under which law which norm and which country in the democratic world does not have their census does not recognize illegal immigrants does not recognize uh, 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 people who migrate for money does not recognize illegal migrations what are we talking what finally i mean i simply doesn't i don't understand oh, i mean you have a wall with mexico you have barbed fence wire why don't you open it all let mexicans come over everyone is welcome why are you sending boats back why do you have problem in giving uh, residency and permanent residency status to why jews only and not the muslims from the very country why kurds only and not the others it's not as complicated as it is it's a very simple exercise which a country has done to to know how many people are there and under which rule and which law uh, they will come and these are all people who had no other place to go to it's a it's a very simple uh, law which has only help people uh, getting recognized and registered with the authorities that's all <laughs> and um thank you very much meenakshi ji i i might uh, tell the members of the city councils that are watching this and i'm sure that their constituents will make sure that they watch this hang out because you have really you have really laid out the law international united states united kingdom india I and mean, if you look at it at the bottom line is caa is one of the most humane laws ever passed i mean you are you under this Parsis are getting citizenship. Christians are getting citizenship. Sikhs are getting citizenship. Hindus are getting citizenship. So it's not like you know one thing. And and for for the longest time, these people, poor people, they've been lying in stateless you know uh, state. They they couldn't get government jobs. They couldn't get benefits of some of the other people getting it, especially those who are trapped in the areas of Jammu and Kashmir. they have gone through hell and now you give them a way out and what is this outrage and i might as well add again meenakshi ji just permit me for one uh, moment you you are seeing that the knowledgeable american voter is not so happy about what you are doing because one of the city council members when challenged why did you pass this law that person said oh well trump supports india and by doing this we are gaining some brownie points amongst the democratic establishment these were the very words but i i am <laughs> appalled at that i am really appalled at that because uh, as an american as an indian i would say i have no uh, no jurisdiction to comment by what you are saying as an american americans are free to think and work the way they think is right but as an indian uh i look at the relationship between two countries and if you want to link it to parties it's your choice i was not linking it and we will have to deal with it when you link it to the parties and 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 i'm very very clear you see they have to understand i one one community was left out and that was muslims so there are a whole lot of muslims from neighboring countries who are also in india and who have also sought citizenship they come under the normal citizenship act it's not as if they are being denied they are falling under the normal procedure which the citizenship act permits that you have you should be permanent resident for 5 years you should have uh, proved yourself that you are not involved in any illegal activity then you should express yourself after 5 years that you want to permanently reside in this country adnan sami is the biggest example the singer who is from pakistan was given citizenship so it's not as if others are being denied the only thing is the route for these people got expedited for the simple reason they have been in this country for far longer period than the normal requirement of citizenship amendment act the second benefit which was given to them was that they became illegal for the simple reason their documents got expired passports got expired their visas got expired so 
that illegality fell under fraro act foreign registration and regulation uh, act under that act if you are illegal and you are criminal because it's a criminal enactment you cannot then apply for citizenship so they could not apply for citizenship that particular aspect of normal citizenship act has been taken out for this this class because you could not handle it three things alone has this act done i don't understand where is the opposition and if there is opposition i am sure people of indian origin are smart enough bright enough to deal with those circumstances thank you very much minakshi ji we are about halfway through our program and i have a whole slew of questions from viewers and uh, now we are going to shift our attention a little bit towards india perhaps i don't know the questions are all over but they seem to be more about the caa engineer riots that took place especially in the neck of your words like uh, delhi the first question from mr manmohan soni delhi riots as it comes out from fir reports seems to be very meticulously planned conspiracy to spread communal violence in the name of baseless and very coordinated anti caa protests all over this is also the first communal riot since 2014 will bjp ensure that justice is done an exemplary punishment is given to the perpetrators without any political compromise absolutely we are very very clear on that and and uh, we've already filed the fir's the fir's are before the court the court has already started taking cognizance and people are behind bars uh, uapa and nia and all kind of provisions have been used to ensure that no such thing is repeated in the country and and we are absolutely certain and clear and the conspiracy has been clear from many many perspective in fact if i may uh, if i if you go by my uh, debate in the in the parliament the areas in which these things i mean ankit uh, ankit uh, 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 was a, a, a policeman who used to work with ankit sharma right ankit right ankit sharma was working with the intelligence bureau of india and uh, it is that region where an isis module was found uh, a year or two years ago and uh, riots have happened in that uh, area then there are other linkages which are there and and if i may be impolite enough to draw the attention of american nationals there is an american national called george soros who went on record to say that i will spend 100 million or billion dollars to see that nationalism doesn't flourish in my country i mean uh, what kind of language is that that if no nationalism is such a bad thing then you should stop being a nationalist yourself stop being american citizen yourself give it up well he... and 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 the uh, i mean and, and you know it's like global times uh, 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 language who say nationalist in delhi or in india uh, are are uh, not to be tolerated I, i have a very simple solution which i tweeted for global times and i have the same answer for the americans who think like that that if nationalism is such a bad thing you give up your nationality and for china i would say that stop taking pride that uh, Uh, uh one country and two systems and three systems or three other states give up your right on tibet give up your right on uh, taiwan give up your right on hong kong because nationality is a very bad thing why why if nationality is a good thing for americans it's a good thing for indians as well that's how countries come together that's how countries strive and and the the quasi federal structure that i represent is as good as your federal structure and we are a democratic country how are you comparing us with terrorist countries and uh, communist countries and what is what is your what is in your benefit a communist country or a terrorist country that's where you want to invest in you don't want to invest in a, in a democratic country you got to answer your people not me i'm very clear about my uh, foundation and fundamentals um uh, the next question is from an individual who is doing selfless service his name is dr omendra ratnu and he runs an organization called nimittakam.org and omendra ji has been spending a lot of his time helping rehabilitate refugees who are coming crossing the border and coming into india from pakistan and also from bangladesh see he is located in jaipur and also one other city and he has a very uh, pertinent question to you madam what he is saying is six city councils in us have passed resolutions against caa 
what is the pr machinery of government of india doing about it i i really don't know i think um uh, i i have no knowledge of that but i'm sure the the uh, the uh, embassies etc should get involved and clarify their position with the city councils with other people and uh the the right thinking individuals in those cities should should be touched upon briefed on and and uh, should be brought forward and i just hope my interaction with you goes uh, that way and explains many things which uh, uh, convinces people that uh, uh, please pick up the paper pick up the law read it yourself and find the fault and if there is none know the per people who are perpetuating uh, this kind of uh, notions have to be rejected um thank you very much madam so just to add to what you just said um there has been help from the US, uh, the indian consulate to those people in cities where they have actually asked them look this is not right we feel that we need to place the facts of the indian government and they have been helping now i think what uh, perhaps people are asking is uh you know this is not the business of any city council in the united states to pass resolutions which are meaningless but Absolutely. time time is getting spent taxpayer money is getting spent and and i as a taxpayer i'm not very happy about this i've made this known many times and this hangout uh, madam is a small effort on our part to bring a like minded lawmaker of india who has actually voted on this bill who has sat through hours of debate deliberated it and has very good reason for supporting this and we are hoping that the city council members who are also lawmakers it's not easy to become that even so i understand that but please understand that by pandering to one segment you are also turning away another segment perhaps a more uh, uh, you know a secular mindset segment and and hoping that once elections come and they are gone that people will forget i'm afraid this kind of a scorched earth policy will not work so minakshi ji i have a question related to this uh, before i go back to the related to the viewers question the question is this bangladeshi and rohingya illegal migrants have now spread all across the country is there a realistic way that the government can come up with a method to say that these people are going to be deported or at least if not that they cannot be able to vote in the elections i mean you can have a green card equivalent in india there's nothing wrong in that I, i'm sure we need to work at those policies and recognize those very um, uh, nuances of migration so migration as a protected mechanism migration for certain duration migration for pr status migration which is economic in nature migration which is permanent in nature now those nuances need to be recognized as a permanent policy for migration and i think there are all kinds of visas uh, which you apply for uh, australian example i don't know how many visas one can apply for uh, multiplicity of agency us also um, uh, similar um, in existence so i think we need to formalize those areas they are um, um, ex in existence but are not verbalized in so many terms and i think uh, we we got to take charge of that and i i have a uh, you know if i if i may be provocative i will say these city councils should also people like you should also pass resolutions that these city councils will import those rohingyas in their own cities let that be the law <laughs> that's a good answer <laughs> yeah, they let that be the law they will take rohingyas because they are being persecuted in india let them open the doors for rohingyas let them open the doors for uh, illegal migrants from bangladesh from india we will be happy to ship them out to you and they will also be happy to be in us and in these very cities and they will vote for these very uh, senators and other members of the uh, council they can do vote bank politics i have no problem with that yes indeed I, and, and and you know some of these city councils are rule bound to invite suggestions from everybody before deliberating on the well they they so they cited corona and didn't do it see this is the thing this is their sneak sneak attack on something that is palpably wrong and i can also tell you where it is all heading madam the reason they are doing all this is they are trying to hide the fact that 
three young girls of minorities in Pakistan are getting raped every day. They want to hide this fact and by, by trying to make all this noise, they are trying to play on the innocence of people saying that India has passed a bad legislation. India has passed a bad legislation. Whereas in their own backyard, they are committing genocide of sorts in the, in the sense that they are they are not killing them, but they are forcibly raping them. No girl beyond 14 is safe anymore in many areas of sin. And, and this one doesn't seem to come across their radar at all. Madam, is there any way the government of India can start bringing this issue in the UN and in the global stage? Hello? Um, we, we seem to have lost her. Just stay for a second. Uh, she is rejoining now. Uh, thank you. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, I'm so sorry that the uh, machine ran out of the battery. No, 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 no worries. No worries. Are you able to hear me fine? Yes, I can. I can. Okay. So I don't know if you heard the last question that I was asking no, you. I didn't. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead and. No, I couldn't hear the question. Oh, you couldn't hear the question. So, what I was trying to say, madam, is that. This appears to be an attempt to try and hide their own problems in the state, the country of Pakistan and in Afghanistan, where the minorities are being treated like in a terrible, horrible way. Is there any way the government of India can raise what is happening in Pakistan? Three young girls being raped, possibly converted every day on the global stage. So I, I think... Uh, uh... Government of India has attempted um, um, recently and in recent past about the uh, condition of minorities in Pakistan. We need more like-minded people to take up the issue, like-minded countries who really believe in human rights and uh, based on those human rights, which is a verifiable data and people should speak statistics and uh, make a case against Pakistan. Afghanistan has its own set of uh, issues with Taliban and all, which is again Pakistan sponsored uh, irrationality working in um, uh, Afghanistan. They, 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 the, the present Paki Afghani government may not be uh, having those issues, but uh, the so in, in the social scenario, there are people, and that makes this class of people very vulnerable. Under those circumstances, and even in Bangladesh, there is a, uh, uh, there is a uh, there is a book written by an American Jew uh, uh, on um, uh, the treatment of um, uh, Hindus in Bangladesh. Basically, Islamists in these three countries, which are which are different from Muslims. Muslims can have different ethos and they, they could be very different from Islamists. So wherever Islamist fundamentalists uh, take over the governance structure and which more often than not Take over, they take over in Islamic Republic. If the name of the country is Islamic Republic, that means there it includes de-recognition of others' existence. And we have seen how many so-called liberal countries have changed their color uh, uh, recently also. That so-called liberal democracies uh, where there was a Muslim majority uh, continued to flout the norms of a liberal democracy and become more and more and more uh, fundamentalists in their approach and for them nothing other than Islam matters uh, uh, right thinking people from those communities come, need to come forward and we need to make a case of human right violation and all this needs to be looked at less from religious uh, angle and more from the angle of human right violation and persecution now I have a question to ask Aisha Bibi's matter the world recognizes who's been given asylum in Canada. If you just scrape the surface, Aisha Bibi sounds like a Muslim name, but she's not Muslim. She's a Christian convert. And originally, she must have been a Hindu Dalit. Yes. Who got converted to, who got converted to uh, uh, Christianity. And she has been provided that asylum. Equivalent, N number of women who have been raped, molested, treated badly, underage girls married off to three times their age, uh, 
uh, violated in every possible way why could they not be tabulated and given asylum by other developing countries why have developing countries not come forward to recognize the kind of bias which exists against hindus i have no problem because my law caa recognizes christians as a vulnerable class in those countries bahais as a vulnerable class in those countries jews as a vulnerable class in those countries and hindus also as a vulnerable class sikhs also as a vulnerable class what is your problem in recognizing all those classes you are only recognizing christians you are not recognizing anybody else but in these three countries if you look at the data all these classes are vulnerable because you are dealing with a jihadist mindset who does not recognize anybody other than islam as fundamentalist even liberal muslims may be at uh, at some kind of uh, uh, risk in those countries but that doesn't mean the other vulnerable class who do not who are who are uh, a citizens have to be recognized because all their rights are not being protected by that very country and if rights are not being protected they are being violated the numbers are there for you fir's are there for you to see minority commission reports are there for you to see on what basis are you not recognizing them as a persecuted class Tough question. Nobody is wanting to answer these, I guess. Um, Rajesh Upadhyay has uh, a question for you, madam. Why is BJP shy to answer about minorities? Why doesn't it say boldly, just stop talking of minority because India is a secular nation. There is no such thing as a minority. Everybody is equal. Why isn't that direct messaging being done by BJP? Uh, we have lived in a certain way for 70 years and uh, uh, when we talk about national fiber and nationalistic fervor i am sure it exists across the communities no way do we want the right thinking individuals from other communities not be part of national mainstream we have seen how caa a simple law which is only recognizing the persecuted class living in the country has been played around with so with caution we are treading the path and slow and steady we are definitely treading the path you've seen uh, the kind of work we have done in last one year uh, i think uh, even even a hopeful like me who lived all these 50 plus 53 years of my life demanding and debating and dreaming the last word is most important dreaming that 370 will go away from kashmir one day 35a will go away from kashmir one day women in kashmir will have, will have equal rights as men uh, to choose to marry whoever they wish to uh, to be able to remain citizen of their own uh, state uh, to 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 completely integrate with rest of india triple talaq will go away from india and lo and behold all this has happened so how we need to handle our internal politics uh, i'm sure we are very very clear on our concepts and we are very clear the right thinking people from other communities need to be taken on board alongside and the nationalistic fiber and fabric needs to be strengthened day by day you know madam you inadvertently answered the next question that was going to be asked um shankar melar kode wanted how to make the muslims of india to understand that this is not against them i think you already answered that thank you very much i'm going to the next question which is a more uh, interesting one katherine anto wants to know please let us know why the bjp minority morcha which has christian leaders also did not speak anything in favor of caa should they not be singing ballads about how the caa was pro christian why did the bjp bjp not engage them or is it not evident that the same minority morcha leaders are stooges of the church and the clergy it's a strong question there no and and uh, i don't think uh, the church was uh, against caa and i don't think the minority morcha has any hesitation in speaking on this what happens uh, unfortunate part Uh, that uh, um, i'm forgetting the name of the gentleman rotrick 
um, and a couple of others from Goa. They had oh, Savio? Right Savio? Savio? Savio. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, these people have been writing about it, very openly speaking about it. People in Kerala have been speaking about it. Unfortunate that media coverage has been very lopsided also. And uh, so far as BJP as a party is concerned, irrespective of the uh, communities we represent, the Muslims in the party, the Christians in the party, uh, Baha'is and Parsis in the party, and every other community in the party, we all stand by CAA. And we are very clear because we understand how these communities are being um, uh, targeted by countries like Pakistan. And in Afghanistan, it's the social fabric which itself is at stake. So keeping all this in balance, uh, I, I'm sure that sometimes the right thinking people do not get enough exposure also in the media. So uh, that could be one reason uh, the message did not come across as if the the uh, the Christians are not speaking the same language. The, 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 the George Soros funded type will not speak the language. And I have no qualms in saying that. Uh, but uh, every other Christian will speak the nationalistic language. Um, actually, George Soros is a Hungarian Jew who migrated to the United States. So, oh, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> to Hungarian Enigma. Jew, Hungarian Jew who, I mean, uh, for that matter, uh, there are other liberals, I will, uh, Noam Chomsky to several others in America who have a different uh, way of thinking. And they forget that they themselves are a part of persecuted class. While they recognize their own religious, co-religiousness as a persecuted class, they have a problem in recognizing others. So uh, they need to sort themselves out uh, mentally and emotionally. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so viewers, uh, we are now getting backed up with questions. I'm not sure how many we'll be able to uh, address in today's Hangout. So please stop sending in your questions now. I still have to work through a few more questions. Uh, Meenakshiji, the next question is from Dr. Ratnu. There are 2 lakh Pakistani Hindu Sikh refugees in Bharat. Why shouldn't the Indian establishment take a plain load of these refugees to UN and US and EU to tell the story of their genocide? No, but who's accepting them? You need visas, you need... Oh, no, no, this is just to show them, tell their stories, that's all, I mean... No, no, even there, even there, even there, I'm sure, I mean, I... Uh, so, uh, uh, I represent New Delhi, where all embassies exist, uh, global uh, embassies. I am interacting with every ambassador, no ambassador ever has been turned down by my office in answering their questions, if at all they have one. So the fact is, they are being fed the right thing. They are, they are being told that CAA is a good law. I'm very clear on that. But it, it is how the internal politics of those countries and those people is working. Like you said in the beginning, that one senator was asked this question. And he said, no, no, we understand. We are doing it because we have internal scores to settle. So. I, I, I am very clear that these are the people who do not lack knowledge or resources if they want to find out the truth. But these are the people who know the truth and are playing it the other way around and are using this opportunity to misguide people, mislead people. That's where the problem is. I always say it is not the problem of intelligence. It is the problem of wisdom. A lot of people who, are, who may be intelligent, but they lack the wisdom and they try and misuse their intelligence. That's what is happening. Next question is an interesting one from Yogesh Dubey. He's saying, why you ask, why don't you ask, I should say, the mayor of Kanpur and Lucknow to send a resolution condemning the Chicago City Council for interfering in Indian affairs and acting as spokesperson of Islamic terrorists? I would do that. Why, why, go, to, uh, why go to Kanpur and other places? SDNC mayor will do that tomorrow. <laughs> uh, SDNC is South uh, Delhi Municipal Corporation, which is uh, uh, just about one third of my constituency. <laughs> um, so the, the next question is from Saurabh Yaar. Even North MCD can do that. Central <laughs> MCD can do that. 
<laughs> so the next question is from Saurabh Vyas. Does the question does the government have any plans to block funding of these anti-CAA, anti-NRC organizations such as the PFI and possibly banning them? Uh, so uh, there is a procedure established by law and anybody who's worked in the legal structure and legal norm and legal format understand is the governance structures will understand that uh, 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 there is a research there is uh, enforcement directorate there is intelligence report based on that these cases are made based on that the government of india takes a call and i'm sure all this all this is uh, in the pipeline and is being processed and somewhere or the other i don't have the numbers lot of such ngos have been shown a red flag um next question is from ojas choudhury there is news that illegal migrants are converting to christianity to be included in caa what are your views on this no no i would say why should they get involved in caa they should all be given to unhrc they should all become united nations refugees and let un take them wherever they want to <laughs> they, they have a soft corner for christians by the way so maybe that is the reason so un can take care of them pragya rathor has a question a section of the media in india has spread that connecting this is a lie that they have spread that connects nrc with caa and saying that the muslims are going to lose their citizenship can you please highlight a little bit more about the strategy that the indian government is going to use for coming up with an nrc for the entire country and before you answer madam i want to clarify to our viewers bangladesh afghanistan pakistan they all have nrcs so don't don't cry that india alone is is in fact it's only india that does not have nrc so i think again we go back to the original uh, point which democratic country in the world like us will always have its own method of you know uh, social security number will have its own classification of citizens will have its own surveys because every government policy needs to be marked for that now for india for example if 5 million 10 million people have been brought out of poverty we've done that kind of work in past 5 years 6 years we brought out more than uh 50 lakh people out of deep poverty and uh, given them uh, a little uh, better lifestyle do i not need to plan for housing do i not need to plan for water do i not need to plan for education do i not need to plan that there are people who are unauthorizedly living in my country they they there may be uh, a network which is operating out of country and it is a citizenship it is not a religion based thing why are you linking the two if you are linking the two that means it is evident that you are fine with nrc of bangladesh you are fine with nrc of pakistan where none of the people from india have migrated post 1948 to 47 nobody has migrated to those countries and in my country it's like a, as as uh, pms used this word is a dharamshala anyone can enter take refuge get into the voting list live take away my resources my resources meaning indian resources and they don't have anything to do back home they are welcome to be here but they have to be here under certain norms certain regulations they could be migrants with the perspective of a working migrant for economic reason they could be some like rohingyas we can give them temporary residency till they find a place and un can give them refuge wherever they want to we can't send them back we are already a country of 130 crore people if we are 130 crore let this burden be shared by people who are less in number and have greater resources to take care of let humanitarian accesses be there and let them take care of them i have 130 crore poor to deal with why are you burdening me with more If there is a humanitarian crisis, please take some burden, share it. Um, Madam, with that, we come to the conclusion of this hangout. 
if you would like to say something in conclusion please go ahead and then after that we will wrap this up so i all i need to say is that um, these city councils are very clearly uh, working towards uh, an agenda agenda is very visible and if george soros happens to be a hungarian jew is i'm very clear he got his residency in us as a persecuted migrant as a persecuted class a persecuted person needs to recognize other persecuted people otherwise you are doing injustice to your creed and please learn more get educated if there are any questions i'll be happy to answer them well thank you very much uh, madam lekhi ji and it has been a pleasure having you on our uh, hangout and we hope to have you again uh, very soon on matters of uh, importance that connects all of us as human beings and once again namaskar and thank you very much jai hind thank you